It is my honor to present the David O. Selznick Award to the indispensable, the titan, Martin Scorsese. Come on! <laughs> Come Thank on. you. God damn it! <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, Guillermo, I don't know what to tell you. I just, you know, tell you how much, I, you know, how much I admire you and the artist you are and, and the master you are of, of cinema and also your great love of cinema, your, your, your generosity for me just in this wonderful presentation. It means so much to me. It means so much to me, all of it. I thank you. I thank you so much, Guillermo. Thank you. I, I want to also thank, I take the occasion now to thank some of the people who helped bring Killers of the Flower Moon to life. The entire team, of course, at Apple, and Dan Freakin and Bradley Thomas, and Dan Lupe here. And um, uh, of course, uh, you know, uh, there are a number of others here are collaborators, um, uh, Marianne Bauer and Ellen Lewis, and. Rick Yon and uh, so many others, um, Lisa Frechette, and um, uh, of course, the Osage Nation itself. What well, Chief Standing Bear's here, and Chet is here. They, they played such an important part, in, more than an important part of making the movie. They made the movie with us, in front of the camera and behind the camera. You've given me a great gift, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart all my collaborators too. Now, I'm gonna, just give me a second here. Uh, on the stage, right? Alfred Hitchcock, James Stewart, Jack Benny, Samuel Goldman, Jack Warner, Norman Lear, Lou Wasserman, Jules Stein, Milton Rackmill, Cary Grant, Eva Marie Saint, Janet Lee, Margaret Layton, Maureen O'Hara, Gene Seberg, Dick Van Dyke, Elkie Summer, and David Oselznick. They were the people on the dais at the 13th edition of this event, March 8th, 1965. Back then it was called the Milestone Awards Dinner, and it was presented by the Screen Producers Guild at the Beverly Hilton, you know, the, 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 the auditorium, the, the ballroom there at the Beverly Hilton Hotel. And at the, uh, that whole dais, that whole, everybody was on that dais, and at the very end of the dais was me. <laughs> I was all the way in the end, you know. I was receiving the Jesse L. Lasky Intercollegiate Award for a film I'd made at NYU. I was 22 years old. It was my first time out west. And I'm up here with all these people. Harry Grant, when I was introduced to him, he was so gracious to me, and he was, you know, helping me out and laughing and that sort of thing. And many of the others were, uh, were, were gracious too. And when Elkie Summer gave me the award, I, I had to get up, like right here, and I, she gave me the award, and I didn't know what to do. It was kind of uh, like I, I taken aback. I was stunned. I look over my right shoulder, and Carrie Grant is there, and he goes, "Kiss her." <laughs> so I did. <laughs> Now, I gotta tell you, the Milestone Award that night was presented to Alfred Hitchcock, who got up to speak after a 34-minute clip. <laughs> okay? It was a shorter of e evening, but like, you know, 34 minutes, of, it's on film, by the way. Um, I'm gonna give you a few of his quotes from that speech, all right? He said, first, when you receive such an award, you wanna pinch yourself to make sure it isn't being made posthumously. Then he said, I see the dais is made up of business associates and good friends, a difficult combination. <laughs> then he said, I find it delightful that stars have been put on the Hollywood sidewalk so we can walk all over them. <laughs> he offered advice about uh, stopping runaway productions. That was an old term used years ago. It doesn't apply here, of course. Uh, <laughs> like movies, they went on and on, they couldn't stop shooting. He said, what you should do is make producers and directors more faithful to their wives. Uh, this was his, his speech, part of his speech. I mean, you know, the, the word bygone, you talk about a bygone era, um, as they used to say, and it really was here in the 13th 
uh, edition of this, this event. It was another world, and coming over the hill is Bonnie and Clyde, and Easy Rider, and the Wild Bunch, so right around the corner, and then somehow we were the ones who were making the movies. The history in that room, Warner, Goldwyn, Selznick, those incredible actors, Hitchcock, I actually got to meet him backstage. They took me over and they said, this is the young man. And he, and he turned to me and scowled a little bit, stuck out his hand and said, congratulations. That was it. Now, the award that I received was named after a man who was there at the very beginning of cinema when it was created. He was working with Cecil B. DeMille and produced the first feature length film ever made in this country, interestingly called The Squaw Man. Later, he produced the first Academy Award winner for Best Picture, Wings, which was directed by William Wellman. There's a, uh, there was a man named Aubrey Schenk who was charged with uh, showing me around. He was part of the committee, and uh, he had the, uh, the task of making sure I was okay and that sort of thing. This guy turns out, he, he produced over 50 B movies, a lot of the films I saw when I was growing up in the 40s and early 50s. Some of them, I only found out years later, some of them were like, T-Men by Anthony Mann and Raw Deal by Anthony Mann. Uh, these were two of the greatest film noirs that if you like film noir, you've got to see these two pictures. This guy was, uh, he produced so many films. If I'd only known then, I probably would have talked his ear off. Um, and it's possible that, you know, some of these names are not familiar to you, but, you know, the continuity from them to all of us here in this room today is a fact. These were some of the people who actually originally brought cinema to life and gave it to us to carry on. So. <laughs> Alfred Hitchcock. Hitchcock went on to talk about Selznick, with whom he had, you know, a very tough relationship. Hitchcock said about Selznick, when I, when I, first, when I first arrived in this country, uh, David Selznick sent me one of his famous memos. I wanted to make it into a film entitled, The Longest Story Ever Told. <laughs> now, look, Hitchcock and Selznick, I mean, they were always at odds with each other on each of the three pictures they had made, which were the parodying case, Rebecca, and um, uh, the, uh, um, how can I forget? Which one? Spellbound, thank you, of course. <laughs> you know, on all three pictures, they were at each other. Um, but the thing about these guys, they cared. They were both, and this is a key word, obsessed by the cinema. They both lived their obsessions. In Selznick's case, he dictated those infamous memos. I mean, that's what the memos were about, the obsession. Now, my relationship to one of his pictures is personal, very personal. Back in 1946, I was born in 42, so I was four years old, and uh, uh, they had terrible asthma, and they couldn't do anything with me, so they would take me to movie theaters, and um, I, I really loved westerns, and I'd see these big, Westerns, you know, horses running around in color and all that. And my mother uh, would take me to movies. Um, and uh, this film came out called Duel in the Sun. And it was condemned by the Catholic Church. My mother wanted to see it. So she took me, she said, listen, the kid likes Westerns, I'm taking him. So she took me to see this film. It's the first film I can remember seeing by title, okay? So the very first impact of classic Hollywood cinema starts right there for me. These slashes of color, the movement, the vast sand landscapes, uh, stunning set pieces like the dance in the cantina, the approaching horsemen lining up against the railroad as they, the railroad's threatening to take over their land. Um, the mysticism of the film mixed with the profane is played out on a larger-than-life screen by larger-than-life actors, Jennifer Jones, Gregory Peck, Joseph Cotton, Lillian Gish, Lionel Barrymore, Walter Houston. At one point, I think Lionel Barrymore says, at, at night, they're up on a hill, it's nighttime, and it's a darkened hill, and he's in a buggy, and he's talking to a guy on a horse. Uh, he said, uh, there's a strange glow in the sky tonight. And those figures of him in the buggy and the guy on the horse are silhouetted against a red sky. And I'm sure, I gotta tell you, that's 1946, I was four years old, but I'm sure that those silhouettes, those figures, wound up in my film, Killers of the Flower Moon, the, there's a sequence with the prairie on fire at night. It stayed with me all those years. 
There's a scene where there's a confrontation in a saloon with Gregory Peck killing uh, Charles Bickford. And Bickford had a wedding ring in his hand and the ring falls onto the floor of the saloon. And there's a beautiful insert of the ring and the wooden floor. It's the very essence of what an insert is. And then there's the shattering finale. Dimitri Tiomkin's blasting score over shots of blazing sun intercut with the look on Jennifer Jones's face. For me, I, I'm just going on about this because for me, these are Proustian sense memories. I was frightened by them and thrilled. And this terrible, beautiful fate for the characters. I mean, it's the stuff of legend, a touch of Greek tragedy, the psychic climate of post-World War II America, the racism, the killers of the flower moon. It all comes back. In the meantime, at home, simultaneously on the small TV screen, they were showing Italian new realist films. But on the big screen, and I was, I was absorbing that, but on the big screen, those overwhelming images and sounds and emotions were all brought into life, brought into being by David O. Selznick. Sixty years later, I actually got to make a film with Selznick, Brian Selznick, it was called Hugo, a 3D film that dealt with the beginnings of cinema itself, much inspired by the productions of David O. Selznick. So, you know, tonight I feel like um, it's really extraordinary, you know, like I've come full circle. I was 22 when Gary, Cary Grant told me to kiss Elkie Summer. Now I'm 81. And I'm glad I kissed her. <laughs> Thank you. I, one last thing. Last week, a couple of weeks ago, I met this great poet, Terence Hayes, uh, back in New York. We were talking for quite a while, and at one point, out of the blue, he says, well, how many people on the planet have experienced as much of the beautiful as you have? And I paused. I said, yeah, the, the beauty because that's at the core of what we all strive to do. And I'm sure there are many who have had the chance to witness an abundance of beauty, but he made me, he made me realize and knew the privilege I've had in this life to have been one of those people. It's a great privilege. And it really started 65, 80, 80, uh, it really started 58 years ago at the SBG on that night. So, uh, to receive this award tonight is something that's very moving and very special to me. I thank you and thank you, Guillermo, again for the beautiful, beautiful intro. Thank you, everyone. In and around 1995, impossibly for me, I met uh, Marty Scorsese for the first time. I was in New York to discuss a screenplay of mine that was going to be produced by him and Barbara Defina. The movie, of course, never happened, <laughs> but the meeting did. You know, and I, I, I'm sure Marty doesn't remember it clearly at all, but I do. First of all, if I may, and this was Marty Scorsese, one of the greatest filmmakers alive now and then. <laughs> a man, a man that had done Taxi Driver, Raging Bull, Goodfellas, After Hours, you name it, meaning a chunky whippersnapper from Mexico with one credit to his name and a weird one at that, Kronos. Now this may sound stalkery, Marty, but I remember exactly how you were dressed. And we spoke about an hour, about a crane or two on Minelli films, the color palette of Nicholas Ray, Mario Baba, the atmospherics of Jacques Turner. I was in heaven. I left about after the meeting, but that meeting never left me, you know? For him, it may have been his Wednesday at 10 o'clock. For me, it was a life-changing event. But that is the nature of his mission, you know, to meet young filmmakers as a keeper of the faith, to change lives everywhere. This man has protected or assisted every preservation effort, every cinematic and festival in the world, and has fostered emerging filmmakers in every nation on the map. He has celebrated South African cinema, Italian cinema, French cinema, particularly important for me, Mexican cinema, and everything you can imagine. He has a keen interest and knowledge of all filmmakers. He cares about the Mexican career of Louis Buñuel, the films of Roberto Gabaldon, the brilliant voice of Emilio Fernandez. You know, the world over, there are films that exist or continue to matter only thanks to the efforts of his world cinema project. He enshrined and secured Michael Powell's place in the pantheon of cinema, supported Kurosawa as his faith waned when he was tackling his final films. 
He has protected, produced the definitive documentaries about some of the greatest musicians in our lives, and he has managed to transform some of the most unforgettable tunes ever created with images of violence, redemption, or tragedy with absolutely unerring instinct and making them forever his and forever ours. His generosity of spirit and love of cinema are evangelical and selfless. To produce is to conjure, to give existence and to beget, to invoke and materialize something that did not exist before or will intervene. That's what everyone in this room does. Well, Marty Scorsese has willed the world of cinema to be a new, different, common country in which we all can coexist. All of us, all of voices, and all the generations to come. In an industry and an art form that tends to be obsessed with the young mavericks, it's important to celebrate and remember how lucky we are to be blessed with true wisdom. Late in their lives, Goya and Rembrandt produced their most profound and perfect masterpieces, one after the other, pondering the same matters that occupy them in their youth, but looking unsentimentally at their internal landscape and their time on earth, looking in the mirror at the pain in their eyes and the world that was reflected in them. We are witnessing right now one of the most important and transcendental moments in Mr. Scorsese's career. He has shown... <laughs> against all odds, he has shown everyone time and again that an artist's spirit cannot be tamed, that will remain vital and even savage, undomesticated, well in the fourth or fifth decade of a prodigious career. Recently, his films have been showing us the true depth of his inquiry. Some of the questions he is probing right now are as profound as those asked in that most beautiful and mysterious book in the Bible, the book of Job. For in it, Job, a just and pious man, questions God and says, how can he allow such dismal pain and brutality in a world where there is so much good? And God answers in unerring power and majesty that all things coexist in the universe because they coexist in the mind of God. For it is infinite and unfathomable, and the good and the bad are both part of it. Or as Marty would put it in The Irishman, it is what it is. Bertolt Brecht once said, there are men that fight one day and are good. There are men that fight one year and they are better. And there are those who fight many years and are very good. But there are those that fight their whole lives. And those are the indispensable ones. 